It was the culmination of work Darwin started more than two decades earlier, after sailing around the world on a ship called the Beagle. On that expedition, Darwin collected thousands of plants and animals that were unlike any he had ever seen before. And when he returned home to England, he became particularly fascinated by the many different birds he had found on a remote chain of islands off the coast of South America called the Galapagos. There was a bird that looked to him like a warbler, and another one that looked to him like a woodpecker, and another one that looked like a finch, and so forth. And he wasn't sure what these birds were, but they were all clearly adapted for very different ways of life. Some ate insects. Some, for example, picked up small seeds. Some could crush the large seeds of certain plants which were found on the Galapagos. So they had different appearances, different beaks, different styles of life. When Darwin asked for help identifying these birds, he was in for a surprise. He was floored, he was stunned to discover that the expert ornithologists in Great Britain told him, they're all finches. That's not a woodpecker, it's a finch. That's not a warbler, it's a finch. But why, in this small chain of islands, had he found finches with such different characteristics? Darwin reasoned that in nature, individual organisms compete for limited resources, like food. If, for example, a bird is born with a slightly larger beak than the other members of the population, that might give it an advantage on an island where large seeds are more common. Over many generations, birds with large beaks would be more likely to survive and reproduce, handing down this advantageous beak shape to greater numbers of offspring than those with smaller beaks. Darwin called this process natural selection because the forces of nature, such as the environment of an individual island in the Galapagos, select those organisms best suited to that environment. And he believed that over time, this could give rise to new species. What Darwin pointed out was a general principle, which is easily observed in nature. Species are not fixed. That with natural selection pushing or pulling or splitting, species can change over time. Darwin thought all the different kinds of plants and animals we see around us today, including humans, could have arisen by this process. He called the gradual evolution of new species from old descent with modification. And he pictured the relatedness of all living things as a great tree of life, with each twig a different species, ultimately springing from a common ancestor. As you follow the family tree farther and farther back, say from our twig, which we're just one twig on this vast tree. What you see is our similarities with apes, and going further down, our similarities with other mammals, further down, our similarities with reptiles, further down, our similarities with amphibians, fish, all the way down to worms and jellyfish and so forth. What you see is a continuity of life on the planet. That is, we're not exceptional in any great degree. We're just a twig on a giant evolutionary tree that includes everything. The common ancestry of all forms of life was one of Darwin's great insights. But he recognized disturbing implications in the idea that humans had evolved from ape-like ancestors. In the eyes of a lot of people, once Charles Darwin had proposed that natural processes could have produced every species on this planet, including us, they felt that took God out of the picture. And about a century and a half later, many people in Dover, like the United States as a whole, agree. One more spider. Come, spider. Yeah. To this day, somewhere between a third and half the U.S. population does not accept evolution. I find it personally offensive because I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God and that the book of Genesis tells it like it is as to how we came into being. Uh, God didn't create monkey and then take man from a monkey. He created man. In Dover, hostility to the theory of evolution had already erupted in vandalism. 
after a Dover High School student painted a 16-foot mural depicting the evolution of humans from ape-like ancestors. The mural was on display in a science classroom when someone removed it from the school and burned it. Now, as Bill Buckingham continued fighting the purchase of the biology book at school board meetings, the science teachers began to suspect that he had been involved. This idea of man and monkey came into the conversation and I immediately remember saying to him, does this have anything to do with that mural that disappeared? And that's when he made the remark that he gleefully watched it burn. Right. Sort of under his breath, but we heard what he said. <laughs> Though Buckingham denied any involvement in the incident, when he reportedly announced he was searching for a biology book that included evolution and creationism, the school board meeting erupted in chaos. Typically, a school board meeting is a very dry thing. A couple of people show up because they have a certain issue they want to discuss. But these meetings would be hundreds of people, and it would be hot, and, and people would be upset. Ludicrous, bizarre. Many adjectives I could use. They were disrespectful to the public, um, disrespectful to the teachers. Um, they didn't want to listen to anybody. They were just on their own agenda. Sometimes in a democracy, and when you have nine different personalities together, and you have a controversial issue, in the heat of the moment, somebody might say something they wish 10 minutes from now they wouldn't have said. Bring this meeting back to order. The controversy engulfing the school board caught the attention of local newspaper reporters, including Lori Lebo, who grew up in the area. From the first time I heard school board members were talking about creationism, I thought this could become a big issue. I didn't realize how big, but I certainly knew I was intrigued by it. Lebo began reporting on the controversy, but her interest in the issue was not just professional. It was also personal. Lori's father had been the owner of a local radio station, but the oldies format wasn't paying the bills, and the electric company was about to put him off the air. The next day, a gentleman came in who belonged to a local church, wanted to lease programming on the radio station, and offered to pay a decent sum of money. And overnight, the radio station became a Christian radio station. My father became born again. In her articles, Lebo would write about the 1987 Supreme Court ruling that would keep Buckingham from introducing any creationist text into biology class. In the meantime, Buckingham was in touch with two organizations known for questioning Darwin. One was a public interest law firm in Michigan called the Thomas More Law Center. Headed by former public prosecutor Richard Thompson, famous for his efforts to convict assisted suicide advocate Jack Kevorkian, the firm bills itself as the sword and shield for people of faith. Bill Buckingham contacted me uh, as a private citizen and also as someone uh, who was concerned that the biology textbook presented only one side and he thought there should be other alternative theories involved. And that's when I introduced him to the theory of intelligent design and indicated that I thought that that theory could be taught alongside the theory of evolution and pass constitutional muster. I asked, you know, if there were any reference books out there, and they gave me the title of the book of Pandas and People. He also found a conservative think tank in Seattle named the Discovery Institute, which calls itself the nation's leading intelligent design proponent. They sent Buckingham a DVD and other material on intelligent design. In these materials, Buckingham found a view that did not seem to conflict with his own. For example, according to the book of Pandas and People, intelligent design means that various forms of life began abruptly through an intelligent agency with their distinctive features already intact. Fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks and wings, etc. And in the DVD he got from the Discovery Institute, Buckingham found more support for intelligent design. 
150 years ago, Charles Darwin transformed science with his theory of natural selection. Today, that theory faces a formidable challenge. Intelligent design has sparked both discovery and intense debate over the origin of life on Earth. And for a growing number of scientists, it represents a paradigm, an idea with the power to, once again, redefine the foundations of scientific thought. Both the DVD and book use the same example to illustrate intelligent design's central tenet, explained here by proponent Steve Fuller. One way to get into the concept of intelligent design is by imagining what it would be like to run across something like this on a beach. John loves Mary. I mean, this is the sort of design that's very unlikely just to have assembled itself just from sand blowing randomly over even a very long period of time. Rather, it shows a sign of some sort of intelligence that's behind it. And just as those words on the beach are clearly the product of an intelligent being, the claim is that some aspects of life itself must be the product of a designer. Intelligent design, in my way of thinking, states that life is too complex to happen at random, that there had to be a designer, uh, something to shape how things went, so to speak. In the book of Genesis, the designer would be God. But in the materials Buckingham received, God is never mentioned. The designer is called an intelligent cause or intelligent agent. 